Look at this. Look at the dragonfly. It's like splayed out on its back. Fairchild, eventually going to meet with Chad. It's going to take us through some different variations and forms of plants. Same species, but they look different. So that's what we're going to cover today. Actually, it looks like you had planted more of the ferns. Oh, yeah. Than so we got I saw last time. Six varieties now. So. Okay. And they are, are they all sourced from like around the same area? It seems that some, you know, were developed in horticulture in, mm -hmm. the, in Thailand. You know, they find different mutations and whatnot. But others are probably wild forms from mm -hmm. throughout Southeast Asia. And we'll look for ones that have different rippling patterns. And probably at least the ones in front here all seem to be from the same species. Mm -hmm. This one is from the Philippines and might be something different. They call that one silver wing. And um, we don't know if it's a wild type or not. but. Uh, and one of the fascinating things is that these all apparently will reproduce from spores. Now, are these, is this an Asplenium nidus, and is it a type of cultivar, or what is it, or is it Asplenium? I think probably that they're a nidus type, but yeah. we haven't nailed it down to exactly whether it's whether they all conform to nidus, because you know, what is a species is kind of a mysterious question. Before continuing further, I wanted to ask Chad his definitions of variation and form, since they often seem so subjective and are used interchangeably within plant circles. Well, they're um, usually a, a, vari a variant, like a variety, is a natural, one that's naturally different, and that the taxonomists, the people who study plants and who decide what's going to be recognized and named, um, they actually, you know, then they, that's kind of their judgment call, basically. And, and in different, because botany is very decentralized. And so basically a, an expert who learns a group will, will start to decide, well, this kind of, this level of, of difference we're going to recognize as a species. And in one group, that may be a higher level than in another group. So it's kind of, there's a little bit of, actually a lot of subjectivity. <laughs> And, uh, but somehow it all works pretty well, and many of species are fairly easy for anyone to recognize the differences. And um, so there isn't really a good, clear, I mean, usually the form, if you say form, it's a little, usually that, in most groups, that means a little less difference in variety. And um, it might be just, and once again, there isn't really a, a one definition that works for everything. It's yeah, because the form could relative. mean like that it has a little speckling on it versus something that is, has a different kind of rippling? Like, where, where is that line? Is this like a line drawn in the sand? Well, it's a line. There's a, in, in the, on the botanical sign, there is, a, there is a line usually. And it's usually when a botanist will work out the naming and classification of a group, he'll write what's called a monograph, a big work that where he'll say, well, these are the differences that are on the species level. And this is a consistent difference, but it's not big enough. We'll make it a form or a variety. Whereas in horticulture, things are much more loose in a sense, how we use these terms. So usually people will say variety or, or form, you know, just to mean something that looks a difference or that, you know, you'd want to collect one with a little few more spots on its leaves that a botanist may not recognize as a formal botanical form. And if it's a cultivated variety, then it's something that was done in cultivation to choose for that specific look of the plant, right? Yes, yes. Okay. That, that's generally the cultivar is just something that arose basically in some sort of artificial conditions. Right. And although sometimes things that people found in the wild that are different end up being named as cultivars because it isn't super formalized and there isn't really any enforcement. So let's, I, let's take a little closer look at some of these and maybe you could point out some of the differences because I think that if we get a little bit more of a close-up look at them, like this one you said has a, like a little silvery form, which I see that. Yeah, this is probably a different species from the others. The others probably conform to something like Asplenium nidus. And this one has spores on it. Yeah, and this one does have spores, yeah. which are usually uh, helpful in diagnosing what species it actually is. And, um, and some of these are, have a natural, are naturally rippled in the wild, but then you, if you grow many from spores, they're, you know, when you reproduce something sexually, you get a variation, generally, if there is variation present already and in, the, in their genetics. And then 
if you, you know, ferns produce, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of spores, and many of those come up, and then when you have all those to look at, you often find ones that might have a little tighter ripple, ones that might have a little wider. Like some of these um, not only have the rippling, but twisting. Mm. So, and then you can add, you know, sometimes they have a little bit of cresting, a little bit of splitting at the end, like there's one down at the other end that has that. And, um, and are you actually propagating some of these by spores to see what the differences come? Or right now you just have these planted in the ground? And yeah, right now there we haven't yeah. we haven't tried growing them ourselves here yeah. yet, but that would be a lot of fun, and we hope to hope to do it now. What do you think the rippling could mean if these are wild types? Have you seen like rippled leaves like this in any kind of fashion before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. the rippling's not all that uncommon, and it's kind of it's it has various purposes because a flat structure, you know, can can fold like a flat piece of cardboard. Or something, but then if you look inside a piece of cardboard, you see the, the rippling, the corrugation, mm -hmm. we call it. And that, when you just have pieces of thin material, that's a way to make them more rigid. Mm -hmm. So um, that may be one of the reasons why we see this also in nature, because that makes these, the leaves, the fronds. A little bit more structurally sound, yeah. Yeah, interesting. It might have something perhaps to do with water too, who knows, you know, collecting water. Yeah, it yeah. Certainly, certainly could. Cool. What are some others that have uh, different variations or forms? Well, we have um, not only variation, this is kind of structural variation in how the leaves are arranged, but then their color variation is probably the most familiar. And um, a really dramatic example of this is the ma mapu palm, Laquala matinensis. And we have, this is one that we've had in the conservatory for a long time. You can see it's got beautiful natural variegation with the dark uh, green spots and lighter yellowish green areas, but then um, if you grow a bunch of seedlings, you find others that have even more contrasty foliage, um, like this one with, uh, with the dark green spots and yellow areas also, but just a, a much stronger contrast uh, between them. It's so photogenic. It really is. So this actually came from the seed of this one, or? This was from a separate, we went, we got this from uh, some nurseries in Thailand where they grow a bunch of them from seed. Mm -hmm. And so the more places you visit, the more variation you get. And we've seen people who had a bunch of them being grown in, uh, in flats in, in Thailand and Indonesia. And the, the variation's amazing. It's just like each of them is a different painting, a different botanical painting. Yeah, it's like probably getting like when you go for, if you're, you're getting a, a dog or anything like that. You could see the different variations of the, the little pups. You could choose like which ones that you want. So it's the same, it's no different than some of these plants. Why do you think um, some of the, the coloration is the way that it is? Because this is, I'm assuming, a little bit more of an understory plant. Yeah, it seems that uh, some of these plants that have this kind of interesting natural variegation, it's sort of a camouflage you know, strategy. It may be you know, to confuse some of the animals that might want to feed on them. Um, but, you know, it tends to be fairly speculative because a lot of these things are very hard to test scientifically. Um, sometimes it may even, you know, have to do with helping the plants maybe survive different variations in intensity of sunlight where they have certain areas that are kind of lighter colored that won't absorb as much of the light. And if you get, you know, if it's, that means if it's fairly dark, you know, for a while, then they've got the really dark green areas that are more efficient at absorbing less light. And then if it gets brighter, those areas get overwhelmed by the excess sunlight. And the lighter areas may be able to then photosynthesize more efficiently. So, I've read, I've read that as a, one of the stronger theories, but it's really hard to be able to test for that. Yes, yeah. Definitely. And especially yeah. with tropical plants, sometimes yeah. the, the environment in a rainforest is so variable and it's Sometimes hard to reproduce that in the yeah. laboratory very well. Yeah. Oh yeah, we do have these. Oh, oh, these ones. Right which here. might be different. <laughs> I don't know if they count. I don't think they count as different species. I think they actually are variants. They're sonorillas. Should, okay. Should we? I think we should highlight them. Okay. At the very yeah, least, you know. They're, they're kind of new and exciting, yeah. and also kind of expanding the comfort zone. I also like the, the dots. I wonder, do they, as they start to mature, do they lose some of the dots at all or do they maintain them? They, they, they send to only get, stay this big. This one over at the far end, these yeah. were fairly recently planted. That one's been there about maybe a year. Oh, wow. And that's kind of what it's done. And, and even we saw, the, we, we saw these in the wild in South Thailand yeah. also. And even on the same little, little hill, there were all these different forms together. Wow. So. 
So you're probably thinking that they are the same species then? Probably, yeah. yeah. Do they seed very easily? Is that how they spread? Is by seed? Because if they're yeah. all close to one another and they all have a different kind of look? look. Yeah, they don't have any rhizomes to, to spread or anything like that. And, and then this one has just like this really um, silver, silver mid-vein. Yeah. Compared to these. There's amazing diversity yeah. in these forms. And there's no doubt a number of species represented, but then probably a lot of these are variants of, of one thing. Really cute plant. Yeah. I mean, I could see it in combination with, well, some of the stuff that you had planted, but also the um, pileas and also some peperomia. It's like a nice small diminutive plant. Absolutely. Yeah. Be a good biopod plant. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, this is definitely much more lush since I've last been here. Things grew amazingly fast, like this tropical nettle, which is now seven feet Whoa. high. <laughs> That's really expanding the comfort zone, the <laughs> discomfort zone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I know we're coming upon some of your favorite plants. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> this is a, a fascinating case of something like evolution in action. It's Ficus deltoidea, and um, it's it's all one species that lives in, in Southeast Asia, from Malaysia through Borneo and Indonesia. And amazingly enough, it comes in all sorts of different variations in their leaves, in their figs, size, color, and even how the plants grow. Some are very tall, some spread, and they're all considered one species, which is... And so but, has there been extensive genetic studies on Ficus deltoidea for you to be able to know that it's the same species, or has there just been a lot of intermingling and interbreeding and... How do, you, how, like, how do you know? There have been a few studies, you yeah. know, to kind of try to sort out some of these different forms. And, you know, they've, they've found differences that clear, make some of them clear cut, mm -hmm. but others not so much. Mm -hmm. But we do know for sure that they are, you know, that they are different because when you grow them in the same place, they maintain their differences mm -hmm. very clearly. And when you grow, you know, raise them from cuttings, they're all always consistently the same. So that's, that's a way, without having to have a, a genetics lab, you can decide something is actually due to genetics. And, um, and it has been shown also by the DNA to be different than, others, than other fig species. So. so these are two good examples right here. So those are, yeah, two different ones. And this really small leafed one apparently is from northern Malaysia somewhere. And um, then this one, we don't know where it came from, but we found it in a, a plant market mm -hmm. in Thailand near Bangkok. And it kind of has these neat uh, depressions between the veins, so it looks almost like a steel drum or something on top. Hmm. And, uh, and a nice uh, rim of gold. And you can see that there are these little gold dots on yep. the leaves, and that's what gives it, they, in Malay, they call it mas chotek, or gold dot plants. And then they often also have nice colors underneath. And some of the ones that grow on Tree branches high in the high in the rainforest will have more of a spreading habit, and then others that grow more on rocks often get more vertical. Um, like this one back here is fairly upright and has small leaves. And then some of the ones, usually the ones that spread out, have bigger leaves because they're usually in shadier forests and need to collect more light. This is nice because you could actually see the figs on this one, and the gold rim is uh, with the sunlight is really obvious. And you can see the branching veins very, very clearly, which is what's really the most unusual thing about this species is the fact that it has those leaves with the veins that split mm -hmm. and dichotomize. And, uh, but then some forms, which we can show you in the nursery, that they're actually switching from one type of leaf, like with a central vein and branches, more normal, and then they'll just switch back and forth. And on the same, on on the the same, same plant? On the same plant. Wow. I've got a couple that switch more than... I think one of the things that actually blew um, some people's minds uh, from the last time that we were at Fairchild was the fact that people didn't realize that they were either epiphet um, epiphytic or epipetric plants because oftentimes when you get them from a greenhouse, they're growing in some type of soil or potting medium that typically you maybe not would see them grow in. So that was something that was like a really elucidating for, for folks. Oh yeah, they are. It's very rare in figs to be an, a true epiphyte or true uh, epipetric plant, um, and they have a really fibrous root system, which is often when because usually plants in those habitats have a really limited amount of soil to work with, so they put as many roots into it as possible, and and also it's great because then you don't have 
the issues with like some of the other figs when you grow them in pots, they tend to break the pots or they, you know, they're very aggressive roots, whereas these love to be in the pot, you know, which makes them ideal houseplants because yeah. they can grow to be very luxuriant specimens even in a small pot. They do well being underpotted and so they're, and they actually, many of them adapt well to low light and a little lower humidity, so they're, I've even heard folks in the UK where they get less light than most part of the US would be yeah. well as houseplants. So. Yeah. Well, I think we'll see more of these um, eventually, but should we go make our way out and find some of those sort of spermas? Sure, yeah. yeah. So this is a good example of, of how uh, variable plants can be in size, because this, yeah. um, this is a smaller version, a dwarf version of the areca palm, Dipsis lutescens, which is, can get quite large. It's from Madagascar. and. Um, you know, you could make it, you could make it grow it as a large pot plant indoors, but then this uh, is a form, a dwarf form that was, arose per, apparently as some sort of mutation in Vietnam, where it's also grown extensively, and it maintains a nice small size. It doesn't get much taller than this and makes it a perfect, you know, indoor plant or a perfect plant for a container outdoors in a tropical climate like this. And it, and it has all the characteristics of the larger, you know, it's the same as species as the larger palm, just has, uh, this much smaller, more compact form, and it, and it also, and it's all reproduced by by taking these pieces off with right. roots, and so they're a clone. It's all one clone. Right. So to, is this ever, if it ever got like, if it ever sexually reproduces, can it actually revert back to a large species, perhaps, or a large form? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Many times, we, you know, if it, depending on how, uh, you know, the inheritance works, that it may, you know, if whatever mutation was dwarfing it, you know, doesn't get passed on to some of the offspring, you know, those might get to normal size and others might even be more dwarf sometimes, you know, that's why. <laughs> it's a roll of the dice. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You just have to uh, be willing to take some risks to find new things. So this is the large size, size one, which yeah, is obviously a big dramatic difference. Absolutely, yeah. This is the type that you'd find in the wild. Yeah. You know, this is of this species and uh, yeah, they get quite enormous and, you know, and are great for big landscapes and for borders and stuff. But then, you know, when you've found ones that have, but they have this really elegant form and the clumping and the clumping pattern. So they got a lot of things that are desirable and mm -hmm. you're just able to shrink that down in that mutation from Vietnam. And is this as how tall it would actually get or does it get taller than this? It can get even taller than okay. this, but it's not a, an extremely tall palm, but yeah. it's a, much taller than the dwarf form. So. Yeah. And there are several other mutations that they've developed in Southeast Asia that have other interesting, more compact characteristics. Well, thanks for showing those like differences. Should we actually head to the nursery now? Okay. That's a bad example by driving over the grass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Compacting the soil, Chad. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> so the tires actually exert less pressure than a footstep, you know, because it's more spread, spread out. out yeah. yeah. Human beings uh, trampling something are surprisingly um, very ele and elegantly go around here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes, this is another one. Oh great! Um, gosh, I'm trying okay. to think. We planted that. This is the Epipremnum giganteum, the Singapore form. This one right here. Yes. It's wow. So much slower growing than the than the normal type. Um, so you have the other one in the nursery. Or you don't. Yeah, we have the other one in the nursery, the more typical form. But this is um, Epipremnum giganteum, a wonderful aeroid from Southeast Asia. It's very widely distributed. Wow. And this this is the the, the natural form that grows in Singapore, and it was shared by their uh, one of their native uh, plant nurseries in Singapore, and. Um, it turns out it's got really distinctive golden edges. Yeah, like the Ficus deltoidea that like we were saying. Like the Ficus deltoidea yeah. and really thick leaves and it's quite slow growing. And so these have been in the grounds, you know, for about a year and a half and they haven't grown all that much. And uh, this, it does it, it, I guess it's running a little scanned it now. You can see the, um, some of the roots coming off of here, right? Yes, yeah. yes. It's definitely will want to climb. Does it climb? It, it climbs, climb. okay. And so that's why we planted it kind of near this palm tree. I in hopes see, that it will, I see, okay. It's going roughly it's, in the right direction. Yeah, it is roughly going <laughs> in the right direction. <laughs> but, but the other form that it's the more, you know, from other areas that we've gotten, they, they actually, yeah. they, they very quickly produce running shoots and can even make a ground cover oh. fairly quickly. Whereas this one, and, and the gold edge is much less pronounced. I would have, um, just by looking at it, 
you know, in planted here, I would have not, not guessed it was an epiprenum. I would have just passed it off or something completely different whatsoever. Yeah. But now you could actually see how it's starting to run a little bit scanned in and how it's like crawling over to the, to the tree. Yes, but. indeed. It seems to be, have a little less of an aggressive climbing tendency. I mean, mm -hmm. much less than, you know, Epipremnum aureum, mm -hmm. the famous pothos. That yeah. Shows you can't really judge a plant by its genus, yes, you know? Yes, <laughs> you, can't, you can't judge a plant by its genus, that's, that's for sure. True. We're planting orchids all over now. Are oh, some of them native species? Yes, okay. yeah, a lot of the, these ones here, some of, a lot of these are either native or Caribbean in here, but then also ones Vandas for show from Asia, so it's kind of a mixture. But for the collection, we're gonna focus on the native ones and Caribbean ones, like mm. those are the less showy ones there. So these are the three sort of spermas that you have here. Yes, these are an example of the fairly underexplored world of aquatic aerides, and um, these were uh, something that impressed David Fairchild a lot because he, he saw some giant ones in the Philippines and the, the, air, the air holes in their petioles were so big you could stick your finger in them and he was pretty <laughs> amazed. And um, because these, the leaves uh, under the ideal conditions can get 18 feet high. Wow. But it's fairly widespread and like many species that, are, that do live over a wide area, there is there's some really interesting variation in how they look and how they grow. Um, and in this case, it's most clear on the petioles, on the stalks that hold mm -hmm. the leaves up. This is our newest addition. This came from Thailand, um, probably was, they had collected it somewhere else in Southeast Asia, but it has smooth petioles and they're dark. And it's kind of dark. And when I think of Certosperma, I always think of like thorns. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it makes these, these are almost smooth. They have little mm -hmm. tiny thorns. So that's quite distinctive. And then right beside it, we have, um, Another one, this is one we've had in the garden since the 1970s. Huh. And it was collected in the wild in the Philippines and it has the much more typical petioles. And it's got kind of the uh, lighter colored petioles with some darker areas and then, uh, you know, quite a oh, few yeah. spines, fairly spines. big spines. Yep. But even still not as... Still not super because it's yeah. probably fairly young. They get more prominence as the leaves get bigger. Because when we uh, transplanted this piece out of the conservatory, yeah, we wore gloves. It was mm -hmm. pretty. <laughs> and this is all the same species then? All the same species, mm. Cerdosperma mercusii. And this one is even spinier. Mm. Um, this is one that uh, came from the famous aeroid collector, Julius Booz, and then Enid, wonderful Enid, uh, propagated it and preserved it in cultivation and shared it with us. And it's got these nice reddish petioles. Right. And uh, we have the, the pretty aggressive spines, which often pseudospermas have. And so these are all, all one species, but all these different natural variations. So you know, it would be so. considered more of a variation than a form. Probably, yeah. but you know, it's a toss up. But, it's a, but once again, it's like it, it depends on the, how, what, what criteria are right. considered important in each group. It yeah. kind of varies from group to group. There and, is no And you were saying even definition. if it was looked through the lens of horticulture versus if you're looking through the lens of botany, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. in horticulture, usually there's less concern about, you know, how things are going to be named necessarily. Mm -hmm. And it's more just, you know, what. You know, will one form grow bigger? Will one form, you know, have color that's more desirable? Will it, you know, will it have maybe better disease tolerance? You know, will it, will it be easier to propagate many times? All those things are, are important, whereas, you know, taxonomists wouldn't really be that concerned about those things. So your title, though, is Botanical Horticulturist, right? Well, Here? it's, uh, it, it's now I'm, they're calling me Chief Explorer is kind oh, of my, okay. my well, new, my new bit, title. That's yeah. a little bit more amorphous then. <laughs> yeah, Because <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask, what side did you fall, on the botanical side or the horticultural side? Well, you side? know, that's the thing is that it's kind of this in-between world. That, because, it, because the reason I, I've studied both horticulture and, and botany formally, but, um, you know, it's, I've always been torn because, you know, I love growing plants and the science of growing plants, but then... It was always, it was usually in botany that they kind of had access and interest in the, mo the strangest, you know, most interesting plants and then horticulture had how to grow them. So they make a good combination. Yeah, they do. Definitely. And now, you know, in the botanical gardens, the setting where you can really take advantage of both because you can grow this wide diversity of plants that are interesting for botany and then introduce them to people as potential things they could grow and enjoy in their own gardens or at home. Mm. So, because, you know, there are at least 350,000 species of plants, so we've got a lot of work to do. We do. Yeah. We have plenty of work to do. Yeah.
<laughs> and we need more people like you who are like thinking about, well, this could be an actually great plant to put into a landscape or to put into a home or be a container plant. So what are you going to show us over here? Yeah, this is a, an Aurelia from Mauritius. It's Polyseus um, mauriciana, and it exhibits a pretty dramatic phenomenon in plants that some, you know, some variation in plants is not due to being genetically different. The different variants we were talking about just recently are all genetically distinct, and if you grow them side by side, they will, uh, their differences will stay. But some plants um, look, look really different when they're young, when they're juvenile, and then they transform when they're bigger, but they're all, it's, the, it's variations that are being caused by the same genes hmm. in, in the same plants. And, some, this is a plant from Mauritius, the island of Mauritius, where this happens in pretty dramatic ways. So these are young shoots at the base, and they have narrow, uh, kind of with some red leaves with red in them and with really dark uh, central vein. And then as the plant gets more mature, it's getting close to flowering size now. The leaves get rounder, much yeah. more round, and the veins uh, start to be lighter colored. And, um, you know, if you were to see just this top part and then see just this bottom part separately, you might think they were different species Completely even. Completely different, yeah. Or, or really dramatically different forms. They yeah. think with these plants from Mauritius that these juvenile um, leaves might be something that confuses the tortoises that used to live on the island, but mm. it's another thing that's hard to test. Mm. Like, yeah, especially now yeah. if the tortoises are no longer on the island <laughs> as well. Yes, yes yeah. that's the problem. And also, uh, you know, and when we get plants in a nursery or something, often we, we have the juvenile forms in the little pots. Mm -hmm. And then if some plants, when we grow them on, they can look, look quite different. Mm -hmm. so. I'm just curious out of that um, Epiprenum gigantum that we, uh, that we had seen earlier, is that kind of more of a juvenile form? Like, do the leaves actually look drastically different when it starts to climb? Or? I think they do change. I yeah. think they do get divided, so it's pretty... That should be the juvenile form. Mm. And this is a very interesting plant from the Caribbean. It's a Phylanthus epiphylanthus. And um, they sometimes call them duppy bushes. They look like philo philoclades, like, mm -hmm. you know, part of a lepismium or that type of plant, like a jungle cactus almost. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so are exactly these stems or are they so leaves? So those are stems, yeah. Wow, okay. So those are stems. And each of these little, uh, little teeth-like structures here, that's a node. Oh. You know, and so... And they make flowers, hmm. just like stems do, these little pink flowers. And in fact, that's where this genus Philanthus got its name for phil, which is leaf, and mm -hmm. then anthus having to do with flowering, so flowering leaf. Even though they aren't leaves, they're stems, because leaves usually, with very few exemptions, never flower. So. But is this, is this in the cacti grouping, or is this its own? It's a totally different family, totally yeah. Totally different family, okay. Doing, doing a very similar thing and, wow. and appearing very similar, but yeah, it, it's... Is, uh, the flowers are what, you know, cactus flowers have many petals mm -hmm. and, and are very, are kind of, it's a little more ancient type of looking flowers where these are very simple flowers mm. by comparison. Oh, it's fascinating. And we have this form uh, that comes from the Dominican Republic. This is actually called subspecies Domingensis, dealing with the island of, of Hispaniola. And um, then we have another form we'll see down the down the way that's from the Bahamas that has much shorter, rounder uh, phyllodes. So what, what is the, uh, the difference then between these? Well, these are, this is all one. This is all one, okay, and that's then, what I was going to say. It the looks one down like the, the same. Hill. Yeah, one yeah. down the hill is quite different. It's much more compact, and it has uh, much more rounded uh, phyllodes and shorter. What's the best way to propagate these? Can you just actually take one of the stems or? You can, but mm -hmm. that, but it usually the, these don't revert very easily. They mm -hmm. can sometimes root, but then they often it's hard to convince them to make new growth. Mm -hmm. So it's better to take a whole shoot. Okay. And like this was this was from a, a, a shoot cutting like these side shoots. Yeah. They will usually root quite easily, and and the true leaves are actually just these little tiny brown things that oh, are, and you know so fascinating. So a branch comes out of the axle of a leaf where yeah. a leaf joins the stem and you can see they're in that order. This is the leaf and then the stem coming out. And but the leaves aren't functioning as for mm. photosynthesis at all and the leaves just fall off. Mm. So the leaves are kind of a placeholder. What a fascinating little plant. <laughs> for the stem, yeah. And then it's got two types of stem. You know, it has its central stem, mm -hmm. which is more normal and cylindrical like stems usually are, and then these branches that are flattened. And yeah, it looks like exactly. this stem will have chlorophyll, but it actually gets woody as it ages. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it does photosynthesis early on, and then. And I'd imagine later, these so side much. shoots, like you're saying, are easier to propagate. But is it harder to propagate when it's a little bit woodier? 
or would you have to like graft it or do some type of other type of propagation? Technique? These for the, the somewhat woody stems mm -hmm. are not too bad. I haven't tried the really, really thick ones, mm -hmm. but they, they've tended to be easy whatever cuttings we use, so. They also have an interesting fragrance, like butter that's kind of off the flowers. With the flowers? Yeah, hmm. which, which the butterflies find really attractive for some reason. Oh yeah, this one's much more compact, a little yeah, denser. Yeah, it's a much more compact form, Small. and this and this originates from the Bahamas, so it's a typical form in the Bahamas versus the other one, which was from Dominican Republic. And the, the phyllodes on this are kind of rounded and have that characteristic curve, mm -hmm. whereas the others are fairly straight and much more densely branched. And, and, the, and the flowers on this, you know, aren't... It smells they, like more like popcorn, actually. No, this smell one. it. Like a... Oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It does it smell like, like buttered popcorn or something. Yeah, yeah, this one is. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah, and the butterflies <laughs> do do enjoy it, and and yeah, this you know will, they're very drought tolerant because that's when having those cladophylls is kind of evidence of the phyllodes. They this one actually looks like a, a deeper to green water. to me, but it could just be maybe where it's planted. I don't know, but it looks like a deeper colored green. I think it's naturally deeper colored. Yeah. yeah. One of the other plants that I feel like has a lot of variation that I've seen so many of, especially in Asia, is the Euphorbia milii. Yes. Um, especially for the selection of the bracts and the different colors and how big the bracts are. And I see you have like a few that are actually planted here, but you could also see some of the, the variation of the, the leaves too. Yeah, those have been actively hybridized and selected mm -hmm. very, you know, very intensely mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia. So mm -hmm. they've got everything from white to red to yeah, yellow. Yellow and, and everything in yeah. between. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's another great example of one that looks like it. it's like splashes of white and red on those. Yeah, that's a good, good example of the variation that's actively yeah. <laughs> brought out in horticulture. Yeah. And there's a cream one there. That's, that one's a nice cream colored. So there's another example of how plants can really transform from when they're young mm -hmm. to when they're adults. These are, this is a, a seedling of this very interesting tree, Cassini oriental, that mm -hmm. is from the Mascarene Islands, Mauritius and Rodriguez and Reunion in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And like the, the Aurelia we just saw, it, um, this is even more dramatic that when this is a, this is a seedling from that tree and the leaves are really narrow mm -hmm. and they have that red vein. Again. Yeah. And it's totally a different family unrelated to that one, but um, doing a very similar thing and then this becomes an adult, which doesn't look very much at all like, like the seedling, but yeah. they're the same, you know, plant. And, and then this, this is the parent. This is the adult, wow. This is the adult, it's much wider leaves, and once again, it lost the red in the vein. Yeah. And uh, when I first saw these seedlings, I didn't really know what they belonged to, because uh, they didn't look like anything around them, and then did some research, and like, oh, that's one of these Mauritius plants that well, they do maintain their serrations, but the serrations feel like they get a little bit more pronounced here in the... Yes. Leaf. Yeah, they do. And this is actually a third generation because we have the original tree is in the back and this was a seedling off that. And the original tree oh, was wow. planted in 1939 or so. And, and then this is a baby and then that's a baby of this one. So, so yeah, this, is the, uh, this one's the original here. So that one that we were with over there is the seedling of this one. Thinking so another. in general, would you just leave the seedling there or would you probably end up taking it out so that it's like, has a little bit more light? Or would yeah, you just leave I've, it? I've harvested most of them to, yeah. you know, to share with people and stuff, but yeah. that, those I just leave for educational purposes. Got <laughs> it. For things another, like this. Another neat, uh, int you know, is like the gumbo limbos, how they change. Like the, some, the some forms have really like peely red bark. Yeah. Cause actually our visitor from Brazil was looking so I want a really red one to bring back to Brazil because yeah. you see in those, they're kind of more gray and right. not peeling, so yeah. So we just went off site of Fairchild Tropical Botanic Gardens and we are here at their nurseries, which we're gonna take a look at some other plants that have different variations and forms. I don't even know how to open it, this way? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, this is um, a more typical form of the uh, the Epipremnum giganteum. Oh, the one that we saw outside. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, definitely. And this is, it also has uh, the gold edge like that one, but a much fainter. Oh, yeah, gold it's edge. you could barely see it. You could barely see it, yeah, yeah. It's usually only on fairly new growth. And the leaves are yeah. 
much less rippled and they're, they're, they're thinner. And uh, this one also grows much faster. In fact, you know, we just uh, brought this back from Asia just about six months ago and it was already vining and we already took cuttings to propagate it. So wow. whereas the other ones, it, after over a year, we hadn't started. Just super it. slow. And they're yeah. even outdoors and do you think would, like every other plant, just take off? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially wow. especially something that's related to pothos, mm -hmm. which is such a vigorous grower. I mean, mm -hmm. so, Fascinating. Yeah, so this is um, another great example of, of natural variation um, and aeroids in this case. Uh, this is a Climbing aeroid from Southeast Asia, Syndapsis pictus. Which I think a lot of houseplant people will know. Yes, indeed. And I've yeah. been seeing a lot of uh, cultivated varieties coming out in the market as well. Yeah. Silvery Ann is a popular one right now. It's a lot more silver than green. And I think a lot of these, some of these may actually be things that actually were found somewhere in the wild in that Ooh, variation that men got a, got a very attractive cultivar name, yeah. you know. So this is. Um, because these, these, these are varieties that are from different botanical gardens in mm. Southeast Asia that were from plants that came out of, of wild at some point. And um, so you can see like even this one with a lot of silver in it that is found with, with silver like that. And this kind of with a more blotchy pattern because it was under the mist for propagation. So it's got yeah. a little bit of the rust yeah. accumulation. So normally these spots would be nice and silvery. And this is an all green form. I actually have this all green form or not, maybe not this one in particular, but I do have an all green form that's starting to revert back to silver. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it just started to get a few different silver splotches on two of the leaves. So which is fascinating. Some plants during development will change color too, yeah. like that, just like those plants from Mauritius. Right, the... right. This one's also very pretty too. Uh, yeah, this one's got the silver, and you can see how the color actually, it's all goes from all green, and mm -hmm. even in this case, to developing the another pattern of silver around the edges and green in the center. And then they're kind of like Ficus deltoidea too. They're all these, you know, local variations throughout the rainforest of Southeast Asia. And do you have more of the Ficus deltoidea here now? I sure do, okay. yeah. Okay. Got well, over, over 30 see. forms. Oh my goodness. So it's... You and your little collection. <laughs> in fact, we're probably closer to 40 at this point, but I still oh, have okay. to Oh, okay, well, I see them now. Yes. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> and they're all spread out and organized. So I call it the deltoidetum. <laughs> the deltoidetum. <laughs> which, of which there is probably one in the world. And, uh, <laughs> and so we have all, probably most of the different extremes that one would find in the wild, from the very small leaf to the very large and everything in between. So why don't you highlight like a few of your, your favorites that really shows some of the, the different variations and forms here. Absolutely. Uh, well, Kind of a characteristic uh, kind of form from higher elevations is this type, which have the really small leaves and small figs. This is kind of from the higher mountains and the leaves don't even look that deltoid. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one uh, extreme. And then I'm a big fan of these really big fan-shaped leaves like this one, this, this big heart-shaped. Those are very attractive. Leaf one, yeah, and this one uh, also has a, a different habit, whereas those other uh, small-leafed ones grow very upright. Mm -hmm. This one tends to spread out because it naturally would grow on branches high in the forests in Malaysia and Thailand and, um, and just kind of spread out on the branch to capture as much sunlight as it can with those big heart-shaped leaves with the dividing veins. So you said this one's in high, is this higher elevations you said? They're often in high, and they're a little okay. bit stressed in our summers here, so they've lost some of their leaves. Okay. And, then, and then in the winter, they tend to get happier. So is the smaller leaves then, would that tell me if they're in higher elevations that they're they're subject to more sunlight or less sunlight or how, how would you think that would be because if they have smaller leaves and this one's like trying to get as much light as possible and then this one's trying to reduce maybe some light or would that be yeah, yeah definitely i mean usually forests in higher elevations mm -hmm. tend to be lower and there mm -hmm. tends to be more you know there's less atmosphere filtering out the uv and intensity of the light so and it tends to be a little cooler and windier. And so all those things, having a smaller leaf is an advantage. And, and in fact, you can see that trend both in altitude with small leaves and in latitude where, you know, the farther north you go, the smaller on average the leaves are. And in the tropics, the leaves get on average much bigger. Yeah, because yeah. it's hard to deal with big leaves in a cold place. Yeah, and, yeah. fascinating, fascinating. And, big, and then this is a, a form with very round leaves that I'm quite fond of that also tends to have very nice color mm -hmm. underneath. 
because um, that's another one of the characteristics of this species is the underleaf color. And these little structures, the little, the little dark spots, which uh, they seem to be oil glands or something that attracts some sort of insect potentially, but nobody's really sure. Yeah. But this, and this one also is quite upright. I mean, it wouldn't have attracted like uh, the fig, like each fig wasp, right? Because there, or could it possibly be a combination of the fruit and the and the leaf attracting? Uh, because I'm assuming these have wasps too. These do have wasps. Yeah, yeah they, they attract yeah. them. We don't. They don't seem to. The wasps don't seem to follow them in the cultivation. So, okay. so none of these make their own seeds. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it it's it's quite possible that that's the case. Though um, it's these aren't really found in most figs, and that the wasps seem to be able to find their way to the figs. So, mm. so they would have a definitely a very different uh, scent than the figs. So well, who knows though? But it's one of the. Nobody's that I know of has studied pollination in Ficus deltoidea, yeah. so it would be very interesting to do. See if well, there are some variations in the wasps to correspond to the variations in the, in the different uh, leaf forms. Is your goal eventually to do maybe uh, a type of research report on all of your Ficus deltoidea collection here? Yeah, we'd, we're hoping to do a little article on it for the Curtis's Botanical Magazine to kind of document mm -hmm. and illustrate some of the variations. And, and eventually, yeah, we, it would be great to do some more systematic research on what makes some of these different and what switches one leaf form to another, because we have some that actually will switch. Hmm. Um, different leaves within the same plant. And actually, this one here is a good example. This one, um, where on the same stem, you can have leaves that have just a single central vein right. and branching veins, which is a little more typical of many leaves. And then just the next leaf is one of these fan-shaped things with where the main vein divides and uh, gets more of that deltoid shape. So it used to be called actually you know, one of the Ficus diversifolia, which I think was a great name, but then yeah. it turned out it had been called deltoidia earlier. And that's how botanical names work. Whatever the first name is that it was given will stick, even if it's maybe not as attractive a name or appropriate a yeah. name. Yeah. Definitely. But. Well, I think you showed us a lot of great variations in forms and even how some juvenile forms will actually, or juvenile plants will change when they're mature across a range of genera. So this gives everybody a great example of just like how unique plants are. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Plants are doing a lot more than you would expect, mm -hmm. you know. They're, if you think of them as these static beings, but as they grow, you know, their movement is in growth and, and changing their forms and, you know, and having their, and as you develop it, it's just like, it's also like how, you know, anything you start paying attention to, you start to notice the subtle differences, you know, like the first beat looks like a green mass and then you learn that there's a lot going on there. Yeah, so. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're interested in keeping track of your growing plant collection, then check out my Houseplant Care Spreadsheets. Get the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet or enroll in the Houseplant Masterclass to access the 350 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet. You'll also get information on the Houseplant Care Tracker, which helps you keep track of your watering and fertilizer schedules. Additionally, you'll be able to record, track, and share important milestones in your plant's life. Details on homesteadbrooklyn.com and in the description below.